Okay, here we go. Last lecture recording I'm going to give for Biology 111. Very exciting. Because this one is about us. That is, primates. Of course, you could think of us as also mammals, and then us as also nested within the larger clade that includes reptiles, and then us nested within the larger clade that includes tetrapods and amphibians, and the larger clade, etc. Right? But here we're really getting to those things that make us unique. And we'll talk about the antecedents to us modern humans and our cousins that are still around today and some of the interactions we might have had with some of these other groups. Okay, so overall then we're going to talk about primates, uh, including hominid evolution, and a little bit about some of the things that we consider to be like really special about us, and that is our nervous system, and especially our brain. And here are some of the interesting and key features of primates. Primates doesn't mean that primates are the only things that have them, but they're some of the things that sort of make us the way we are. There's about 230 to 270 species of primates, all descended from this sort of common and arboreal ancestor. Now, we all have grasping limbs. We can grab things with an opposable thumb. So our thumb will rotate like this, which is an important feature for moving around in trees, but also for manipulating objects. Now, we have forward-facing eyes, but which is good for 3D vision. We're not the only thing that have this. For instance, predators tend to have 3D vision because they're looking ahead and they need to have good navigation and depth perception moving forward. Whereas herbivores that are being preyed upon tend to have eyes on the side of the head, so they have a wide field of view. We also have this big cerebrum, a particular part of our brain, and a big brain generally, which we're going to talk about in today's lecture. The shared feature between all these groups is eyes in the front of the face and this grasping hand with the opposable thumb. Okay, let's take a quick look at the prosimians. These tend to be uh, arboreal and nocturnal. They were once found on all the continents, but now really they're only found in uh, Madagascar and parts of Africa and Southeast Asia. Lemurs in particular, which you see in the upper right there, I've never seen lemurs personally, have undergone this massive radiation within Madagascar where there are no other primates. So this is sort of fitting the theme of when you have missing niches, you have the radiation of the remaining groups into those niches. For example, Lemurs evolved, prosimians evolved, in a time when Madagascar was connected to Africa, diversified in Africa, but then anthropoids was involved in Africa, never connected to Madagascar. So the lemurs radiated within Madagascar, but the anthropoids radiated in the rest of the world, largely replacing the prosimians, including the lemurs. But not all the prosimians, because you do have uh, some pro um, prosimians found in Africa and Southeast Asia, including uh, this Galago here. Uh, and I took this picture. Uh, once we took a picture and blew it up, they saw it had something in its mouth and thought maybe it was food or something like that. Turned out it was a baby. It was carrying its baby around, which I didn't know until I blew it up on the, on the camera. Now, the big group, of course, is the anthropoids. Now, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on the anthropoids, uh, but I just want to quickly highlight this one weird thing, the Tarsier. And there's a really funny video um, that you can watch about uh, the Tarsier by Z.E. Frank, who has a whole bunch of funny videos. Here we will learn true facts about the Tarsier. The Tarsier is one of nature's smallest primates. Now, Tarsiers were among the smallest primates, and they're the only carnivorous primate. There's a lot of really cute videos of them with their big eyes at night watching a, watching a, a Katie did or something, and then grabbing it and biting it apart. You have the largest eyes of any primate relative to the head, and they're so big they can't move them. One of the first distinctions uh, in the monkey lineage is that between what people call New World and Old, old World monkeys. So New World monkeys, of course, are those that are in the Americas, uh, including Central and South America, whereas Old World monkeys are those that are found in Asia and Africa. There's a couple of major differences between them. Probably the most obvious is the prehensile tail. That's sort of the classic monkey tail that you see them hanging from uh, in some cases. It's not present in the Old World monkeys, having evolved in the New World monkey lineage. So here are just some Old World monkeys that I've seen over the years. Uh, Long-tailed macaques in Indonesia. 
Uh, these in particular were used to tourists and getting food from tourists and they could be very aggressive toward tourists. And actually they have a partnership with humans in some places in Indonesia where they will steal things from tourists and then local people will say, well, I'll get that back for you for a little bit of money. You pay them money, then the monkey knows that, that this person's going to give them food and then it brings it back. The, and then you give it back to the tourists. So basically they have a kind of a deal going where they make money and food by stealing things from the tourists. Uh, on the lower left, you have baboons right on the southern tip of Africa. And this population was really cool because there was this very uh, young baby that were in this baboons. And then on the right, you have a vervet from South Africa. And this one was kind of fun because uh, the vervets were running around and they do have tails, even though they're not really prehensile. And it was just funny because uh, I just kind of felt a kinship to the monkey because I had a young kid and at that point um, this one was trying to run away and the mom was just holding the tail like this. It's like, okay, okay, and the monkey's trying to run, the baby's trying to run away and the mom's just holding the tail like this so it can't run away. But if you want to go see the most uh, old world monkeys, I suggest going to Kibali National Park, which is in Uganda. And here's some pictures I've taken in Kibali National Park and you saw videos of some of these uh, monkeys at the introductory video. Now, if you go to New World Monkeys, here are some monkeys I've seen over the years in Panama. Um, in particular, the white-faced capuchin on the upper left there. Spider monkeys, this one was, was kind of aggressive to us because we were up in a canopy tower and it was almost like the monkey um, couldn't really understand why there were people up in, this, uh, up in the uh, rainforest canopy with them. And so they were actually sort of you know, barking at us and looking at us and making noises toward us. It was pretty cool. And then howler monkeys in the lower left, which have the one of the loudest mammal calls. You can hear them echoing all over the rainforest in um, Central and South America, really fascinating animals. Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll notice I said vervets for old world monkeys, and I said them again for new world monkeys. And that's because the vervets that are in Barbados are introduced from Africa. So there are old world monkeys in the new world, but they've been brought more recently. You will see them all, or a large set of them, if you go into the Panama Field Studies semester through McGill University. Similarly, uh, if you go to the Barbados Field Course, or Barbados Field Semesters, you can, of course, see the vervets. And then the Old World, if you want to go to Kibali National Park and see all the monkeys there, including chimpanzees, well, then you need to do the Africa Field Studies semester through McGill University. One branch of the monkeys became the great apes. So that includes orangutans and gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos and us. So these are our closest relatives and there are a number of morphological and behavioral differences between the rest of the great apes and ourselves. In particular, we tend to be a more uh, gracile, that is lighter, more upright, lighter boned, um, larger brained uh, version of the great apes. And there are a lot of other differences between the great apes and us. In particular, we seem to be specialized for long, long distance sustained running, much more so than all the rest of the primates. Now we're going to talk about the hominids, that is the branch of the great ape lineage that eventually evolved into Homo sapiens, us. And so I'm going to go through several of these different groups, which you can see arranged on this particular diagram according to the length of time they were present relative to millions of years ago. And so let's start with um, Artipithecus. So there we go there. Now, when people try to use these fossils, what they do is they try to infer the evolution of the various things that we consider to be particular to the Homo sapiens lineage and the, the hominids in general. For example, when do we get our big brain? When do we start writing, walking upright? When do we start moving out of Africa? And so by looking at all these old fossils, you can attempt to infer the sequence of the events that led toward Homo sapiens. Now, this particular fossil was found um, in Africa, and it dates to about 4.4 million years ago. Now, the interesting thing here is that fossils suggest that it walked upright. But it still had that primitive big toe, grasping big toe that we don't have anymore, but the chimpanzees do, that you can hold onto branches more easily when you're climbing. 
which suggests that it was still sort of in this transition phase between arboreal living in trees and living down on the ground. So now these are sort of considered the gracile Australopithecines. These are ones that are relatively light bodied. And so you can see the, the fossils on the upper right, and you can see that they've uh, gotten to be quite a vertical upright posture. So basically suggesting bipedal locomotion. Uh, a number of fossils here, but the most famous would be Lucy. The key thing here is that they are indeed upright and walking, and you can see um, some places where you see human footprints, uh, Australopithecus footprints going through the mud, showing that, yes, they were another phase on this trajectory toward upright bipedal walking and eventually sustained and long-term running, endurance running, but they still didn't have a big brain suggesting that bipedalism, upright walking, evolved before the big brain evolved. Now we continue down with things that are more related to us and also more recent. So now we're looking at the er early uh, Homo genus. So we have Homo habilis, Homo ergaster, and Homo erectus. You see Homo erectus lived until relatively recently. Now these were um, starting to show some of these changes that are more similar to us, including a much larger brain case, as you can see, and a flatter face, like ours, in contrast with the Australopithecines that you see up above. Now, there are a couple of uh, representatives here that tell us that these things are really starting to evolve uh, extensive tool use, a number of social activities, the beginning of the use of fire, and so a number of these things that we think of, of as smart human-like traits. So for example, Homo habilis, habilis meaning handy or skillful. These were in Africa about 2.5 to 1.5 million years ago, and here you saw the first major tool use about 2 million years ago. They had a shorter jaw and a bigger brain, suggesting that these tool use uh, was one of the things that sort of is either generating and promoting the evolution of big brains or vice versa. Homo erectus, which I said uh, lived for an extended period of time until quite recently, was believed to first be the first hominid to actually leave Africa and spread out into Eurasia. And we'll, turn, we'll return to that when it comes to Homo sapiens a little bit later. So they were present uh, from 1.6 million years ago up to 250,000 years ago. And here you saw the first use of fire. Now, these were uh, basically as large as modern humans, but they still had a bit of a smaller brain. And now finally, we get into the more recent Homo groups. And so you can see that all of these basically were present until very recently. And here you have the really large uh, brain case and the much flatter face than any of the antecedents that came before. So uh, Neanderthals was discovered in the Neander Valley of Germany, uh, and they did coexist with humans. So they didn't disappear until about 30,000 years ago is when they seem to have gone extinct, possibly through interactions with Homo sapiens, us. Now they were short and stocky and powerfully built, but interestingly, they had larger brains than we did. So it is believed that they were no less smart than we were. As a matter of fact, there's pretty sophisticated art that's been attributed to Neanderthals. Of course, with us, we arose around 250,000 years ago, and then we uh, rose in Africa and spread out of Africa to Eurasia and eventually to the rest of the world. We had this larger brain than the earlier Homo species, but not Neanderthals, uh, and it seemed to particularly favor this uh, increasingly complex social life, which Neanderthals probably had as well. Now, here's the interesting thing, is that as Homo sapiens spread out of Africa, and here you see postulated migration routes from the origin and postulated migration times, where, for instance, they spread into Europe 40,000 years ago, and then they spread up through uh, East Asia 30,000 years ago, into North America during the height of the last glaciation 20 to 15,000 years ago, spreading southward through North America, causing the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna, and then down into South America by about 15,000 years ago, then occupying all parts of the world except, of course, um, some of the Polynesian islands, which would be colonized later, and Antarctica. Now, here's the thing. So as they're spreading out, look at those dates, 40,000, 30,000 years ago, Neanderthals were around, and that's partly why it seems like Homo sapiens caused the extinction of Neanderthals, because right when humans spread out of Africa, Homo sapiens, Neanderthals went extinct soon after that. But that raised the question, do we have other sorts of interaction with Neanderthals? And the big one being, did Homo sapiens actually interbreed with Neanderthals? Because we were very similar to them. 
So is there genetic evidence of this? Well, people could extract DNA from bones of Neanderthals, and you see them in the lower, uh, lower left there, from a number of different locations, and uh, here's some places in uh, Europe where you have fossils of Neanderthals, extract DNA, and when they looked at mitochondria, they found that there was no relationship between Neanderthals and humans, suggesting no interbreeding whatsoever. Then genetic methods improved, they looked at the nuclear genome, and they found similarities. And it's clear that about 1.5 to 2.1% of DNA of non-Africans, that is people outside of Africa, is estimated to be from Neanderthals. So it seems clear that Neanderthals and humans interbred. Was there anything else out there that we might have interbred with? So some uh, fossils were found in this cave here and sequenced and then compared to our DNA as well. And if you do that, you see that 4 to 6% of DNA in Melanesians, that is New Guinea and Australia primarily, is from this group called Denisovans, because the cave is in Denisova. So here's a little bit more of a picture of what's happening. So you can see on the top there, you have Homo sapiens and Neanderthals splitting off from the Homo erectus lineage. Uh, and then they colonize and spread out through uh, Asia and uh, Europe and Asia, and as they do so at different periods of time, they interbreed with different other groups and then spread to other parts of the world where they bring some of that DNA with them. I highly, highly, highly recommend this book here. This is one of the best scientific books I've ever read. And it's by uh, Svante Pablo, who was the scientist who developed these techniques for sequencing ancient DNA and for uncovering our shared ancestry with Neanderthals, Denisovans and a whole bunch of other related questions. It's a very well written book. So this begs the question, is this DNA good for us, bad for us? And why do we still have some? Well, you can look at a bunch of fossils, Homo sapiens fossils from different points of time uh, in Europe. And so these are the age of the different fossils. The red bars indicate the different particular specimens that have been sequenced. And the uh, y-axis gives the percentage of Neanderthal DNA in them. The key point here is it looks like Neanderthal DNA is decreasing through time, suggesting it's bad. But there's some super, super interesting exceptions. So remember when we said that Denisovan DNA is only found in Melanesia. But if you look at particular populations north of that, you see uh, Neanderthal DNA at high frequency in particular parts of the genome. And if you look at uh, Tibetan, people in the Tibetan plateau, high elevation, they have almost fixation of the Denisovan DNA, whereas nobody else has it. At that one place in the genome, and it appears that that one place in the genome is really helpful for high altitude adaptation. So we borrowed a bit of things from the Neanderthal and Denisovan uh, genome, and some of those things were beneficial to us. Now, uh, one more homo group I want to talk about, and that is uh, Homo floresiensis. And this one is a particularly exciting recent discovery because they were really different morphologically. So they were found in Flores in Indonesia, uh, and the initial dates suggest that they were present until 17,000 years ago, which means they were there when modern humans, Homo sapiens with Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA, spread south into Melanesia. Which, of course, begs the question, all of this, that did they interact, modern humans and uh, hobbits? And, of course, everything suggests that they did. Except for the fact that it looks like the DNA dates were wrong, and, in fact, they probably went extinct um, no more recently than 50,000 years ago, which was before Homo sapiens spread in there, and therefore there probably was no interaction between Floresiensis and Homo sapiens.